I, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so stuck on this still. I'm so stuck on the tabernacle. Of course, that's where we are in Scripture anyway, Exodus 26. It's, the, it's about the tabernacle curtains. It's Exodus 26 and 27 that I'm going to read. So let me go, let me go through it first to, to, to hit it. We put God's word first. Um, but it's Exodus 26 and 27. They're not very long, but so let's just read through it. Exodus 26, 1, make the tabernacle. Now, oh, quickly, God has said to Moses, he's on the mountain. This is his 40-day fast on the mountain with God. He's not even going to drink water. The presence of God is going to keep him alive. Matter of fact, he's going to be more vibrant. He's going to be like Daniel and his buddies just eating lettuce when all the other guys are having steaks and wine, and they suddenly look better than everybody else and, and because they're following God's directions. And so they're, you know, they're eating like bunnies. These guys are just eating like carnivores, and at the end they still look better because they, did, they followed God's directions. This is like uh, that Moses is getting fed and nourished by the king of kings and he's sitting in his presence and he's just listening to the instructions. God is revealing to him what it's supposed to look like because he keeps saying repeatedly, make it, make the tabernacle the way that you saw it on the mountain. And nope. he said, it's so important that you do it exactly the way you saw it on the mountain because that's what heaven looks like. I'm giving you a replica. I'm giving you this mini microcosm of what my throne room area looks like at the Holy of Holies with the cherubim power angels swirling around it singing holy holy I'm giving you what that looks like make it the way I tell you it has to be right Exodus 26 1 he's up there listening to God God says this next make the tabernacle with 10 curtains of finely twisted linen and blue purple and scarlet yarn with cherubim woven into them by a skilled worker. Now he's about to give him, by the way, a ton of instructions on what materials to use. And he just told him when he first got there, here's the offerings you're to ask for. Don't mandate them. This is not a tax. Ask for those who I move on their heart to give you gold, twisted linen, uh, these different colors of uh, fabric that you're going to make the curtains with, uh, all these things, these special kind of leathers that are water resistant, all of these things you're going to get from them, which they got from Egypt. They walked out looting Egypt, they're going to give it to you. You ask for it, it'll be on their hearts, and the ones who's on their hearts to give will give. So he starts giving them instructions with the materials that Moses doesn't have yet, that he knows, that God knows the people are going to give to him. So, make the tabernacle with ten curtains of finely twisted linen and blue, purple, and scarlet yarn with cherubim woven into them by a skilled worker. Uh, a lot of, lot, lot of commentaries for different ways about this. To me, it reminds me of when Jesus said, uh, I, have, I have others not of this sheep pen that I'm going to bring in. Right now, it was for the children of Israel, but I have others I'm going to bring in, meaning the Gentiles. And he's clasping them together. Gold is always a signal of divinity. It's always a sign of holiness. It's always a sign of God. He's saying these two huge things that make up the tabernacle wall, it's going to be, it's going to be the Gentiles and the Israelites. And I'm going to clasp them together. I just think it, that's what it feels like to me. Out of all the things I saw, I was like, hmm, I think that would look like it. Make curtains of goat hair for the tent over the tabernacle. Eleven altogether. All eleven curtains are to be the same size. Thirty cubits long and four cubits wide. Make the tent a covering of ram skins dyed red. And over that, a covering of the other durable leather. Most people think that was some type of aquatic mammal. It might have also been sea otters. They're not sure, but they know that whatever it was, it was waterproof. So when they finished this tabernacle, not only would it be super dark with four heavy-duty curtains over it, you couldn't see in. It was completely covered. So you'd never see in from the outside. But it also was watertight. So every time they went and moved, and the priest's job is to keep that lit in there, to keep the incense burning and to keep the candles burning, to always keep that going. It, if there's a rainstorm, it's not getting in there. Make upright frames of acacia wood for the tabernacle. Each frame is to be 10 cubits long, a cubit and a half wide, with two projections set parallel to each other. So we're looking at something that's, uh, you know, 15 feet long, two and a quarter feet 
wide, just so we get a picture of what it is. Make all the frames of the tabernacle in this way. Make 20 frames for the south side of the tabernacle. Make 40 silver bases to go under them, two bases for each frame under, one, under each projection. Set up the tabernacle according to the plan shown you on the mountain. He will say this again and again and again. Make a curtain of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and finely twisted linen with cherubim woven into it by a skilled worker. Hang it with gold hooks on four posts of acacia wood overlaid with gold and standing on four silver bases. Hang the curtain from the clasps. Place the Ark of the Covenant law behind that curtain. That's the most holy place. The curtain will separate the holy place from the most holy place. So the tabernacle's in these two rooms. The most holy place, only the ark in there. Then you come back a little bit, you've separated it with this thick curtain, and you're in the holy place, not the most holy place. Put the atonement cover of the ark on the covenant law in the most holy place. Place the table outside the curtain on the north side or the right as you walk in of the tabernacle and put the lampstand on the left or the opposite on the south side. For the entrance to the tent, make a curtain of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn and finely twisted linen, the work of an embroiderer. Make gold hooks for the curtain and five posts of acacia wood overlaid with gold. Cast five bronze bases for them. <sighs> That's a lot. That's your Lego set. This is the inner tabernacle and there's going to be a courtyard around it. But this inner tabernacle is broken in two pieces Ark of the Covenant, huge heavy curtain. You can only go in there once a year as a high priest with blood for the, your sins and the sins of the people. Wipe it on the mercy seat. Back out. You're done. Every year after year after year for 1,500 to 2,500 years, however long it took to get to Jesus. Then backwards, you're in the holy place and on this side is the communion table with the bread on it for the priests and the 12, 12 pieces of bread for 12 tribes. Then the priests can eat those. No one else can and replace them with more bread. There's communion happening all the time with the priests. But, the, but first, Peter calls us a kingdom of priests. So we eat that communion bread now. This is an example of what was to come. Over here is the lampstand. Boy, we talked about this. Golden lampstand, divinity. Gold, nothing else. It's not overlaid with anything else. It's just gold. 75 pounds of gold with the three branches on both sides. It's lit at the top. That's Jesus. It's lit on the branches. That's mankind. Six, the number of man. All one piece. Because we're residing in Christ, you light up the world around you as you remain in the vine. It's a perfect, permanent image of what Christ is through us, in us, with us. And it's in the temple. It says it's just like what's in heaven. Then there's also incense in there. And we'll get to that later. Those are the three things that are there before the most holy place. Moses is told by God, I will meet you in the most holy place. So he walks in whenever he wants. He's like, set it all up, Moses. You do it. You can come in. I'll keep meeting you at the mercy seat. I'll always meet with you at the mercy seat. And he says the same thing to us. Moses' is New Testament. I will meet you at the mercy seat. I'll meet you where my blood touches heaven. I will meet you there. And from there, you can be in the most holy place. And when Jesus died on the cross, he ripped the whole holy place apart anyway and said, this is useless now. You don't need this anymore. All right, back to what's happening. Listen to whose idea it was. Whose idea is this? Have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all the furnishings exactly like the pattern I'll show you. That was in the last chapter. It is God's idea. Moses didn't say, would you please stay with us? He does later after they build a golden calf, and God's like, I can't stay with you guys. He's like, please stay with us, and then he does. But here, whose idea is it? It's God's idea. He wants to be where his children are. 
He's in heaven. He says, make a copy of heaven so I can be right where you guys are. Tear it down, put it back up. Wherever you go, put the temple back together so I can reside with you. It's my plan to constantly be where you are. And as you're nomadically moving around, I always want to be with you, always. And when you settle down, build it there, a permanent structure, because I want to be where you are. He's built a permanent structure inside of us as we are called the tabernacle. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us and he calls us his temple. He wants to be where we are. It's his idea. This, look what's happening. The first thing Moses tells him, here's the Ark of the Covenant, here's what the lampstand's supposed to be, here's what the table's supposed to be, and here's how you build the tabernacle. And the next thing he's going to talk about is the courtyard, and then, and then the laven uh, where you wash and stuff, and, and the idol, uh, not the idol, the altar, where you, where, you know, it's not the most holy place, but it's where regular sacrifices are going to be made for their sins and for things that they do wrong. It's this form of their worship. Without blood, there is no forgiveness of sins, the word tells us. So that's going to be a regular routine in the courtyard that everybody sees if you're on the inside. There's one gate, there's one way in. You'll find about that in the next thing. But here's the wild thing about it. As God starts delivering to Moses how to build the tabernacle, notice how he does it from the inside out. He starts at the most holy place. Then he tells him the furnishings that go in the tabernacle. And then he tells him how to put the overlay over it, the tabernacle curtains. Then he tells him how to build the altar and how to build the outer wall, which is just going to be all curtains because it's going to be mobile. He's, He's telling him from the inside out. The exact same way that the Holy Spirit works inside of us when we become the temple. The exact same way. You invite Jesus into your heart and he begins on the inside. He doesn't start on the outside. He begins on the inside. And if you're on the outside, it'd be like sitting outside the temple. All you're seeing is the goat's hair and, and, and the dugong skins or whatever they were, otter skins or whatever they were. All you're seeing is this ugly outer edge and you don't see what's inside. You don't see the gorgeous woven cherubim with these golden and blue and scarlet threads all through. You can't see that unless you walk into the temple. You can't see the really amazing stuff unless you walk into the tabernacle and it's lit up and, and you're seeing it all with the candle. But if you're outside of it and you're looking in, you don't see anything cool. You just see this outer ugly wall meant to keep you outside. There's only one way into the tabernacle. There's only one gate to get in. God is showing him from the inside out. If you're seeing a brand new believer, you see nothing at first. They feel it, but you see nothing. You might see tears, you might see something wild, an expression on their face or anything, but their life is going to start slowly changing as they respond to this Holy Spirit that's now living in there. The healing starts from the inside out. They're still going to do all kinds of things. There's going to be all kinds of cuss words coming out of their mouth from the world they just came from. There's going to be all kinds of things, that, ways that they live, movies that they watch, things that they choose to do that are going to look like the world because that's where they came from. And then it's going to slowly start healing and changing as the Holy Spirit convicts him and says, nope, not that. That separates me from you. That makes you see me less. Don't you want to see me more? Don't don't you want me more than the world? And you start to get this hunger and this pull and this desire from the inside out. If you cut your skin, it doesn't heal on the outside and then the inside. It heals from the inside. And that slowly builds up until there's a scab on the outside and then that turns to skin again. He's seeing the healing from the inside out. He's been showing you, start in here at the most holy place and work your way outward. That's how Jesus always works. He gets in there and changes what's there first to make it look like heaven. That's what he's trying to do, make it exactly like what is where I live, Moses. Make it look like heaven. Do it exactly the way I say. 
And Jesus comes in and he starts changing. He's the one who's kicking walls down. He's the one that's breaking things. He's the one that's convicting to make what's inside you look like heaven instead of earth. That's the first thing that's very striking. The second thing is that you can't see how beautiful it is until you come through the gate. You can't see how beautiful the tabernacle is until you walk through the gate. You don't come through the gate, you just see dugong skin. I don't think that's pretty. It doesn't even sound pretty. You just, you just see the outside dark edge. That's all you see. But you come through the gate and then you see the worship and you see the, the embroidery and you see what's on the inside. That You can't see it from the outside. The world can't see what Christ is doing until they come through the gate. And then it opens up to you and then you see the embroidery and then you see the importance and then you see the value. But you can't see it without blood sacrifice. You can't see it without coming through the gate. There's only one gate. And it's narrow. It is narrow. There's only one entrance to the whole tabernacle. And Jesus explains it. He's so clear. And John, in John John 10, 1 starts like this. Very truly, I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who doesn't enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate, that's the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the, door, the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own by name and leads them out. When he's brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. All I can picture is every time they strip down the temple very carefully, only Levites, doing and wrapping everything so you can't see it, so they can go safely, and then they put it all back together. What they're following is a pillar and a cloud. <laughs> what they're following is a, is a cloud that's up in a pillar and a firestorm at night, and they keep following it. And he says that my sheep know my voice. They will follow me. And, they, and then they put it all, they reassemble, then he moves, they pack it up, and they just go. Same thing happens today. Jesus speaks to the body of Christ. I don't know how many times that I've given a message and someone said, oh my gosh, I, was, I tuned into that, but at my church, they said the same thing. They, they were in the same scripture. They were in the same place. Or it was a different scripture, but they said the same thing. It's because the Holy Spirit is directing the show. And so, go a little further, but they'll never follow a stranger. In fact, they'll run away from him because they don't recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used the figure of speech. The Pharisees didn't understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said, very truly, I tell you, I'm the gate for the sheep. All who've come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep haven't listened to them. I'm the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They'll come in and they'll go out and they'll find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I've come so that they can have life and have it to the full. I'm the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. He's the gate. He is the narrow gate. There, it's narrow because there's just one way in. It's through Jesus Christ. It says you don't know the Father if you don't know me. There's one way. There's always been one way. From way back, there's been one way. You want to go through into the temple? temple? If you want to worship the way God called them to worship, the way he was instructing them to worship, the way he was training them to worship so they would understand the value when Jesus finally came, you go through the gate. That's when you see something beautiful. That's when you understand the worship. John chapter 5 and verse 39, it reads like this. You study the scriptures diligently. He's talking to the Pharisees again. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me and yet you refuse to come to me to have life. He's telling them, and this would have been hard for them to hear, they're so used to a God that says worship at a distance. And he's telling them, I'm here. There's no more distance Repent, the kingdom is here. It's near, it's here. He's telling them, you think you're going to get eternal life through what you're reading. Those only point to me. 
You must come to me to have eternal life. I am the gate. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. Then he goes on to say, don't think, in verse 45, don't think I'll accuse you before the Father. Your accuser is Moses, on whom your hopes are set. If you believed Moses, you'd believe me, for he wrote about me. That would be a big statement for them to see. Well, he didn't write about you. Yeah. Fifty chapters of the Bible are dedicated to the building of the tabernacle. Fifty. You know how many chapters were dedicated to the forming of the universe? Is that not significant? Heaven was first. And he gave 50 chapters of the word of God for us to understand that that tabernacle means something. That it wasn't to be overlooked, that it's not just silly scriptures about pomegranates and almonds and cherubim. It is a picture of what heaven looks like now and a picture of everything that God was going to do through Jesus. And then God speaks to Noah and Abraham and Jacob and Joseph and Moses and a progression of prophets and men of God. He's constantly saying, I want to be where you are and I want you to be where I am. I want to be with you. The separation for now, there's a, it's going to be semi-permanent until Jesus arrives. I want you to understand that sin of man separates you from the most holy place. So the tabernacle was made ugly on the outside and beautiful on the inside. And the tabernacle was made with a small little gate and most people would never even see the, ta the tabernacle, the holy place or the most holy place. Only a few priests got to go there. And they'd never even see all that amazing stuff that was in there. They'd never even know. They'd live their whole lives in just the first courtyard with sacrifices for their sins that they would regularly do because they kept breaking the covenant. And, and they'd just see this ugly outside. It's all they knew. And it was, a, it was a picture that there is a separation of sinful man and a holy God. And that the only way to break that separation was through the gate. It was, it was always that way. It will always be that way. It always has to be that way. And only the blood of Christ, only that very thin way to God is the way. It was designed on purpose this way so we'd see it, so we'd understand it. But you and I, we're the other set of 50 loops that, have been, that get to grasp on to what these people lived through and le learned from and experienced all these thousands of years. We come late to the party and Jesus just says, all you need is me. We're late to the party. We don't have this giant history of worship with, with sacrifices. We just walk in now and he says, I already took care of your sin. Just accept my free gift. And you are the tabernacle. The whole temple, it was to reveal himself to man. It was to reveal man's condition when he's apart from God. And it was to reveal the means by which God would unite us again. It was the whole purpose. It was everything it was designed to do. John 1.18, Jesus expressly says that no one can come to the Father but through him. He was the entrance. He was the gate. It's the priest's job to keep the light of Christ burning. It's the priest's job to continue throughout all generations to keep the light burning. It's our job, kingdom of priests, to keep the light burning throughout all generations. It's our job that the next generation has the light burning in them. 